Hi everyone, this is Dr. Vic again, and I am back with a video for my Weird Economics site on um, how I would like you to go through the process of using supply and demand uh, to analyze a couple of different markets. And I just want to lay out the steps really quickly here for you to, to, to see good examples of. So let's look at one scenario that um, I'm very familiar with, and maybe many of you are too, Uber. Um, let's have a, I, don't, I think maybe some of you are familiar with um, Uber's pricing strategies. Um, and a typical one is, is laid out here. Let's say that the number of people wanting an Uber doubles every day at rush hour. We want to use supply and demand to basically predict what should happen um, given a competitive market environment. So what we, the first step on all these things, step one is always to create an initial equilibrium, a place where we can compare um, our later changes to the model. And so what I'm gonna do is create an, an initial supply and demand equilibrium here. And we have to think about, okay, well, what does that mean? Here's our supply, which is upward sloping, and demand, which is downward sloping. This forms the equilibrium, E1. And let's say that the price here, let's just give it a, a, you know, a reasonable random price of about $10. And let's say that we're in a in a uh, town uh, city like Pittsburgh, maybe at any one time there's a thousand drivers or a thousand riders seeking an Uber. That's our initial equilibrium. So we want to think, okay, what does the initial equilibrium mean? Well, it's it's before we have the shock. You know, the shock is from the scenario the number of people wanting an Uber doubles every day at rush hour. So we want to see the effects of rush hour on some kind of previous equilibrium. So E1 represents that previous. It's a non-rush hour equilibrium. Okay, So that's what E1 represents. So now we want to take this shock of rush hour and think about, OK, what does this affect? All right. Well, we use our hints from our, our theory is that it's people wanting an Uber. So people wanting an Uber, is that a demand side or supply side? Well, it's a, it's a demand side because people want something that makes, means people are the consumers here. So the number of people doubles. So essentially we have, we're going to have a shift out in the demand curve, out this way, right? So let's create a large demand shift and call this D1, or sorry, I guess we'll call it D2, right? That represents rush hour, greater demand in rush hour. And what happens in equilibrium? Well, the, the increased number of people creates a shortage. You have, at rush hour, you have all these new people getting off work that, that want to uh, want to come to, uh, want to ride a, an Uber, you go out from 1,000 to say about 2,000 here, right? The, the number of people wanting to ride doubles. So you have a shortage because you still only have 1,000 Uber drivers. Well, what happens? How, what, that shortage has an upward push on prices. And so that entices more drivers to, to get out of, uh, to bring their cars out and try to pick up rides. So supply ends up meeting demand and that increases the price. So let's say we have a new price of, well, we'll call that $17. And in our new equilibrium, maybe in somewhere in the middle at about 1,500 drivers. So we have a new equilibrium here, E2. So E2 is the rush our equilibrium. So our overall effects is what do we uh, we predict that price rises 
and the quantity of people riding also rises. That's our effects. It happens to be that Uber prices uh, uh, automatically adjusts their pricing during rush hour. This is called their surge pricing policy. And it makes some people mad because they don't like prices go up, but this is standard economic theory here. Let's do a second scenario. This is another one we should be familiar with, especially around here, um, looking at the market for opi opioids. Um, in the 80s and 90s, pharmaceutical companies started increasing their market to encourage physicians to increase the prescribing of opioids. So previously, we want to we want to have an equilibrium one here that shows the previous policy, and the previous policy happened to be that. Um, opioids were only prescribed for very terminal patients, people near the end of life um, who were in great pain, uh, the desire to ease the suffering in, in someone's last days. Because it is very well known that opioids are extremely addictive. So we want to make that our initial equilibrium, this previous era when opioids were rarely prescribed. So we want to we can add an additional element here and think about the demand for opioids. If someone is in great pain, um, their their demand is more inelastic. Um, they're not going to they're going to be pretty much just as willing to pay say ten dollars a pill as they would five dollars well, let's say a hundred dollars a pill as they would fifty dollars a pill. It's not a pricing uh, a price driven type of product. There's an elastic demand. And the supply of these things, you know, uh, after a, a company's making millions and millions of pills, the marginal cost of an additional pill isn't very much. So it's going to be a very elastic supply. So we have supply and demand here again. Demand, I should call that D1, and supply 1. Okay, and then we have equilibrium one. Okay, so equilibrium one is pre 1980s rare use of opioids. Ah. Okay, so again, we started off with our initial equilibrium. Let's say that that's $50 per treatment, and let's say that there is, you know, 100 users in this market. This will be the um, prescription opioids in Indiana. Okay, that's the market that we're doing. I should have made a list here. This is Uber in Pittsburgh. You always want very nice labeling for these graphs so I know exactly and you know exactly what market we're talking about. Okay, so our initial equilibrium here is E1. Here's the shock. What happens when pharmaceutical companies greatly increase their marketing? Okay, marketing, what does it do? It, it, it increases one's uh, desire to, to have a product, to buy a product. Here at pharmaceuticals, since consumers don't directly buy um, prescription drugs, they're offered it, given it by their doctors. So, you know, pharmaceuticals is a very strange market. But if if physicians start prescribing it more, that's what is that? It's not changing the supply. It's not changing the number of pills that are made. It's changing about the number of people who buy them, right? So this is also a demand shock. You get here, you have this you have more being purchased essentially, pushed by doctors. So this is a, also an increase in demand. So we're gonna move from D1 to D2 here. And again, I'm just using basic logic, basic supply and demand. Now we move to a new equilibrium here, E1, E2. Because the marginal cost of, of prescription drugs don't go up that much, um, just by making a few more, it's not a 
large increase in prices due to inelastic supply. But what happens here is we now have a lot more people taking these prescription drugs. Um, and this essentially reflects, you know, greater usage, greater usage of the drug and uh, greater addiction to opioid painkillers because now the people who are taking opioids are um, not just those in, 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 at the end of life, it's people with long-term chronic pain, back issues, knee issues, things like that these were being uh, prescribed for. So supply and demand shows this, uh, this effect of, of pharmaceutical policies to encourage more physicians to use it. So basically, our prediction is more addiction. And, um, you know, this, this goes along very easily with what actually happened. So two examples here, very piecewise, very well labeled. Um, always start with a well labeled initial equilibrium. Use your logic to incorporate what's happening in the new scenario or the shock. You have, uh, both of these happen to be demand shocks, but you do the same thing with supply shocks. And then you analyze, okay, what do what does our model predict? Our model predicts here that it's going to lead to more addiction. That's actually what happened. All right, good luck with everything. Take care.